We certainly appreciate you joining today. If this program is even somewhat like some of the many Ride and Drive events we've hosted over the last seven or eight years at Black and Beach World Headquarters, I suspect we will have a fairly wide variety of electric vehicle interest. Everywhere from the extremely seasoned longtime owner to recent acquisitions, no doubt now enthusiasts, to folks on the, the friends, people can, contemplating their first purchase, to even just some of those that are curious what the fuss is all about. So welcome this morning. Glad you could join us. I certainly appreciate that this online forum is suboptimal. It's nowhere near as fun and exhilarating as getting to test drive different kinds of electric vehicles. So my sincere apologies in advance. It also doesn't lend itself well to meaningful Q&A. It's clearly impossible for anyone watching a recorded version to participate. So we're going to try something possibly a little bit different this morning. So just the same, I'm hoping that this program will provide something useful to everyone and not just be seen as a bunch of EV owners bragging about their experience or telling the latest tech news. So to make that happen, I'm going to ask each of you participating in the audience today to use the comment section to provide your own answers and comments to the subjects we'll be discussing. The idea being that even though we may not be able to respond to each of these comments, this will help provide a much, much wider perspective that will hopefully help others participating today or watching later get a better idea of what the EV experience is all about. So without further ado, my name is Peter Lofspring. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and then introduce you to our panel today. I live in Leewood, better part known as next door to Overland Park, Kansas. My role here at Black and Beach is the chief compliance officer. And I'm responsible for our code of conduct related compliance practices, which have absolutely nothing to do with electric vehicles. But I've been a big fan of electric vehicles for many years and I've run our ride and drive event and helped support the company's movement into the EV space over that period of time. I'm the owner of a 2016 Nissan Leaf which is bought used in 2019. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that here in a minute. So I'd like to introduce you to the rest of our panel. Let's start with Marilyn, then Rob, and then Paul, if you would. Take a moment to just give a quick intro as to where you live, your role at BV, and a little bit about what you drive. Thanks, guys. Marilyn, take it away. Sure. Thank you, Peter. And hello, everyone um, who's online. Thank you for joining us. So my name is Marilyn Daviolouette. I'm located in the Bay Area of San Francisco, North Bay, more specifically. And uh, my role at Black & Veatch is uh, Director of Business Development. I focus on EV charging infrastructure for public charging and fleet charging. And I'm the owner of a Chevy Bolt. Uh, I had it for the last four years. And before that, I had the Nissan Leaf, so same as you, Peter, for many, many years since 2013. So going from 120 miles range to 230 miles range was a very nice thing. So we'll talk more about that later. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> good afternoon or good morning, everyone. This is Rob Wilhite, and uh, I am in the small town called Belmont, which is a western suburb of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I am currently leading our global distributed energy business at Black & Veatch. Uh, that's a portion of our business where we design, build, and even maintain uh, commercial solar for a lot of customers and utilities. Uh, we also work on battery energy storage systems. And if you crunch those together, you can call them a microgrid. Uh, so we design and build all of those systems as well as help the utilities integrate those systems on their power distribution networks and we also provide asset management services. And my electric vehicle of choice is a 2017 Tesla Model S, which I bought new uh, just under four years ago. And look forward to talking about that later in the show. Over to you, Paul. Hey, good, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on your, your time zone. So uh, this is Paul Stith. I'm also in the San Francisco Bay area towards the south side near Santa Cruz. Um, been driving electric since 2011, um, and that first foray into it was with a Nissan Leaf. 
Um, we, we do lease our vehicles, um, but basically by 2012, we'd replaced two SUVs with uh, electric Nissan Leaf. Since then, we've had three Leaf, four Chevy Bolts, one RAV4, one uh, Honda EV, and I was also um, lucky to drive the Mini E from BMW. So we're kind of been in the family for a while and uh, happy to join the call. And, and my, my day job, call it at Black and Beach, look after our kind of new technologies, new market approaches um, for the upcoming markets here in the States and, and globally. Wow, Paul, I didn't realize that you were single-handedly supporting the entire EV market. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about when you actually purchased your first. I know mine was a 2014. I bought it. Uh, I mean, I bought mine in 2014. It was a used 2012. I'm not a new car guy, um, but I am a, guy, a gadget guy. My wife would tell you I'm a recovering engineer, but it's not just any gadget. I'm very much in favor of technology. It makes people's lives better. Um, and to me, to be worthwhile, new tech has to be bigger, better, faster, cheaper. As one of our senior execs would say, funner. And I thought when I bought that, that the, the leaf that I bought really met those criteria. Um, Marilyn, what's your thought on that? What was your original, your first one and your motivation? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an inter interesting detour for me because my first uh, EV, so the Nissan Leaf in 2013, um, came through uh, the company I was working with at that time, which is Schneider Electric. And I was part of the development of the EV market for Schneider in the United States. And um, they had this great approach that all people working in this EV field should be driving an EV and should experience firsthand what it is to, to drive an EV, especially uh, at that time where there's very little uh, public charging. Uh, options. Uh, Schneider was involved also in the in the, the deployment of chargers, just like Black and Veatch is now. Um, now Black and Veatch is more on the infrastructure side. So um, that was my first experience. So m my short story on it is um, living in the North Bay and having a lot of clients in the Silicon Valley, I was not able to use my car um, uh, as a round trip with only one charge. So when I was going to Silicon Valley, which is 80 to 90 miles from where I live, I had to find a charger. So I was either charging at the client's um, um, company place or in public charging. At that time, there was very few DC chargers, so they were very precious. But um, I'll talk about it later. I did get stranded once or twice. <laughs> so that's my story. And, and of course, uh, when I moved into... Um, uh, first of all, uh, at Black & Veatch, uh, I kept the Nissan Leaf, the lease for a while, but then uh, uh, I was eager to get more range. So at that time, I um, bought a um, Chevy Bolt. So I have it since 2017. And um, what I found really interesting is, especially living in California with the subsidies, is the total cost of ownership, when you look at it, is... Uh, was very, uh, very competitive already uh, four or five years ago. So I've enjoyed the ball to put the kids and the dog uh, in the cargo space. Rob, you've got the Tesla. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's great. Um, it was four years ago this month when I first test drove it and fell in love with the, uh, the vehicle. I mean, I was in the market to buy a new car at that point anyway. <clears throat> Despite the fact I have an old fashioned Rolodex on my desk, I was wanting to get something new and innovative. So I said, what the heck? Let me go out and drive a Tesla. I had two friends who owned those vehicles back then, and they couldn't stop talking about them. And uh, once I drove it the first time, I was hooked. That was an ice-breaking moment. In other words, it broke me of the habit of buying internal combustion engine vehicles after that point. So it's my first and so far only electric vehicle. I don't have near Paul's experience, but uh, I, I love the car. Um, I really bought it for performance and handling. Uh, I just love the way it drives. The acceleration is just pure, straight, linear acceleration. No gear changes. Uh, it feels great. And it's really just jaw-dropping fun. Uh, that's a real reason I was hooked on the electric vehicle market. And I'll, I'll probably never go back uh, to an ICE vehicle any longer in my lifetime anyway. Paul, what's your thought? You've owned quite a few over the years. Yeah, so I, I do always give credit to my wife, um, who said, look, this is something coming. It's interesting. I mentioned we leased vehicles. Um, so 2010, started kind of stalking it a little bit. 
um, as far as like, well, what, what is this about? What's it look like? We actually went to that drive tour that was hosted in Moscone Center in San Francisco and drove a car indoors um, around a test track. And it was just like, wait, this is different. This is amazing. And and, and I am a techno nerd by, by, by trade. So it just became something. And it's kind of like, yeah, that's really interesting. Two SUVs in a family burning a ton of gas, about $700 a month, went down to $70 electric. So our payback was immediate uh, when we did that. Um, and really, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. Why do we still have a gas car? Why do we do this? And then, you know, did, did get involved in the advocacy side, which, which led into uh, quite a few more things. Interesting. You know, I had some subtle reasons as well that kind of went along with my initial purchase. You know, I was concerned, of course, like everybody talks about environmental issues. You know, and, and my thought was, you know, EVs can be powered by renewable generation resources. Clearly a trend we're heading toward. I figured, you know, if I could be part of that huge demand that was going to be created by EVs, that would ultimately help. And clearly every mile driven on electric or on renewable energy, especially, would be helpful. And likewise, geopolitical. You know, what happens when some of our least favorite countries lose economic power when demand for their primary resources is even just seen to be going away. We already saw OPEC, you know, what happened with Saudi Aramco, you know, they weren't for sale until it really looked like petroleum was going to be a thing of the past. So, and how does that help countries that are our friends? So for me, you know, that was part of it too. I'd rather provide funds for a farmer in Iowa than a Saudi Sheikh somewhere. And then finally, I thought about battery development. You know, that's going to be huge in years to come. EVs really help drive battery development because it's a key piece of the technology that makes it work. And I think that will help improve our lives in many, many ways. Um, if nothing else, help kind of resolve, help solve the intermittency that we experience with renewables, enhanced portable electronics, things like that. So when I looked at the EV purchase, it wasn't just for the fun. It wasn't just because you know, the, the cost was considerably lower. There's quite a few other reasons. Um, well, let me ask you guys. Okay, so your top consideration when you selected your car. Rob, let's start with you. You've got the Tesla. That's a, a pretty pricey unit, but it's a really fun car to drive. What was your thought there? And then, Marilyn, will you follow? And then, Paul, you're yeah, thanks, Peter. I um, I mentioned this earlier. Performance was a big factor for me. Uh, the vehicle just handles uh, beautifully. It has uh, additional software controls. The uh, semi-automated driving capability is, is actually pretty cool. Uh, Self-parking capability that, that is offered is pretty cool. Uh, the vehicle I own today is not the same one I purchased four years ago due to many of the software upgrades over time. It's, it's added new features, new functionality. Uh, so the vehicle continues to improve after the fact of buying it. And then also the buying experience is completely online. Uh, it was fantastic to go to a sales center. Uh, in fact, I don't even think they even call them sales centers. The, the salespeople are, are certainly available to you to help test drive, but they don't put any pressure on you to buy the vehicle. They're not paid on a sales commission basis. So the whole buying experience is much more pleasant. Uh, you put your order in online. Uh, it took 77 days for my vehicle to be fully manufactured, shipped, and prepped. Uh, for delivery. And the website keeps you informed at every step along that whole life cycle. Um, so it's pretty cool. You can track the progress of the vehicle uh, along every step and after it's shipped out of California to my home state in North Carolina. And I really, really like the ability to drive right past smelly gas stations. I don't like to stop at gas stations. In fact, the only reason I do now is maybe to get a cup of coffee if I'm on a trip or something. So um, I think that the idea of having low maintenance is very attractive. The only thing I've really done to the vehicle in four years is replace the tires. And even that was easy because uh, I had the tires shipped to an installer directly. That installer brought the tires to my driveway at my home and installed them directly for me. I didn't even have to get out of the house or allow him or, or anyone to uh, enter my vehicle. And so that's it. it. It's been real simple to own and a pleasure to drive. Marilyn, your thoughts? Yes, uh, thanks, you, Rob. Uh, I think you capture, you know, the essence of why we become a EV owner or leaser really well. Um, I'm not a senior VP yet, so I can't follow your track of buying a Tesla. The price was definitely a consideration for me. I'll get there, though. 
<laughs> but um, it's certainly a beautiful car to drive. But uh, on my side, I was looking for more of a convenient cargo space. Uh, we are outdoors family and uh, we do a lot of trip, not very long trip, but trips. Um, and camping and all that and uh, so that that was the main motivation of course the price uh, so i have a chevy ball the price was really uh in the right range um at that time so i had it for four years um already the uh maintenance like you mentioned rob uh, is a huge benefit of when you look at the total cost of ownership that's what everybody might want to uh, consider so don't look at the price just as a standalone, but uh, really uh, look at over a period of time when you keep your car. Um, this this car and the Nissan Leaf was the same, is never, never in the shop. And the only reason you, you bring it to um, the dealer or, or your favorite, you know, garage is to uh, rotate the, the, the tires, I would say. They check the brakes and uh, that's it. And then we change uh, our tires just like uh, any other car. There's nothing else, so which is really outstanding. And then in my case, um, I had solar panel in my home since 2002. So I'm a long time uh, clean technology uh, adopter. Um, it made a lot of sense to have an EV because I was thinking, well, I'm contributing in getting renewable uh, energy into my car as well. So uh, that combination of, of having access to renewable energy and being able to charge at home because I think most of us, uh, when we can, we, um, of course, charge at night when it's cheaper. But if you can contribute with re access to renewable energy, that's even better. And um, and in terms of, uh, you know, possibly odd edge uh, with power, what I'm considering right now is to get the small energy storage pack uh, at home. Uh, I have to say the price is still high on this, so I'm waiting for the price to go down. But we, um, it's part of the package when you consider an EV. It's kind of nice to be able to, of course, charge at home and uh, have access to this power. So those has been have been my main motivation and terms of quality of driving, uh, so outstanding, like Rob said, and um, the, the torque, of course, the acceleration, the silence, all those cars, that it seems to me, have fantastic audio system. Um, so I'm always enjoying um, uh, the stereo in there. And also the software capabilities are very good. Tesla is by far, I think, a top, top line for that. But um, even, even the Chevy Bolt is doing great with the software capabilities. So yeah, go ahead, Paul, because you have a lot to share as well. Yeah, so I, I kind of mentioned about the, the immediate savings in, um, in the fuel cost, um, maintenance, all those things, definitely. Um, we were actually commuting and taking our daughters to school 25 miles away from our home um, in this time frame. So that's why we had some ridiculous uh, fuel bills. We also had, you know, all wheel drive, big SUVs, which was kind of, you know, the thing at the time. So it was really a big brain shift that started slowly and just kind of consumed our, our, our thoughts. Like, for example, making sure that you're using every energy efficiency measure you can in your home. Uh, Marilyn mentioned solar, but, you know, we went through and put LEDs everywhere. We went through and put the little meters on and found those things that were actually, um, you know, call them so-called power vampires. So things like, you uh, the, you know, the BCRs, the tape, but, but solar uh, satellite boxes, stuff like that, that actually consumed a, a lot of energy. So it really changed a lot of our perspectives about how we're consuming and, and fueling a vehicle, which became an, an ongoing passion uh, with with regard to this power outage thing. And of course, I'm in PG&E in the territory here and, and live in the mountains. Um, you know, the opportunities that open up because we're using electrons as the fuel, the ability to use those in a constructive way to fuel your home, to fuel your appliances in a, a V to G or vehicle to building configuration, um, just starts like your, your mind really opens up quite a bit when you could imagine pouring the fuel into your tank and pouring it out and then using it you know, in, in your household. So a whole bunch of things kind of all came in at once that uh, really just propelled, um, propelled the thoughts even further, like how can we do even more and, and as the technology's proved, it's just been amazing. You know, that's interesting. <clears throat> Most people think about charging their car from the house, but going the other way, 
I, I sure see us going that way. I think you, with my decision, it was similar to everyone's. It was price and performance. You know, once I'd made the decision to go with an EV, it's just a matter of getting the most bang for the buck. I'm actually not a new car guy, so I buy used cars typically. And in this case, I was able to get like a fully loaded Leaf. Uh, it was 2016 when I bought the 2014. Uh, 2014 when I bought the 2012. Sorry. Um, it was every bit as nice as the Infiniti Q30 I rolled out of. Um, it's quite a bit more modern, for sure. It was a lot more fun to drive. Uh, clearly handled better. It was much easier to park, turn, etc. And the nice thing, we'll get to this here in a minute, is it really didn't cost anything to operate. I, there's plenty of places around to find free power. There's no oil change. Anyway, get to that in a minute. Um, all right, Paul, let's start with you. What hesitations did you have? You've got a lot of cars there. And then, Rob, if you'll follow that, Marilyn behind, her, behind him. So I think everybody really does talk about range right out of the gate. And, and I think that that's been in, was in the context of the vehicles that are available early on. I think there's an awful lot now that, that new drivers will have an opportunity to take advantage of infrastructure wise, the range of the cars. So I think range was probably one of those things. Um, the, the others probably is like some folks are curious about batteries and like, and, and, you know, what you hear about them, do they actually, um, you know, lose their capability, ability to hold charge. And I think that the early folks in did experience some of those things. Not, not an OEM hasn't had some questions about that. So I'm going to put it this, most of my concerns have now actually been taken away. The cars have much more range. The technology is quite a bit more proven and the options for charging are, are abundant compared to what they were before. So it's it's really, there's no, none of those early excuses are, are left. I'll just throw it that way. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point, Paul. I, I too initially had range anxiety when I first bought uh, my electric vehicle four years ago, but I solved that in the first 30 days by taking a multi-state trip from North Carolina down to Florida and back. And at that point, I started to trust the software that it tells you where to stop at superchargers, how long to st stay at the charger and then plugged in, and when to resume the trip and get back underway because it optimizes the total time and tries to reduce the total time of your uh, drive for that particular trip. So I fully trust the software now. I no longer have range anxiety. Um, there's been a few times I've taken my battery down to 5% or so, never below that, but certainly around 5% and, and trusted that the software was accurate. Uh, it even tells you how many people are plugged in at that particular station at one time and how many stalls are available and open. Um, so it, it all works seamlessly. Uh, I've never had an issue with that. So range anxiety, as you said, Paul, is, is no longer an issue. That's off the table. But let me address the cost side because... Teslas are generally going to be uh, priced at a premium compared to comparable vehicles and, and even other electric vehicles. Uh, at the time I purchased mine, the full federal tax credit was available still. Um, so that factored into the decision. Uh, they also offered 0% financing, uh, which was also a, a very attractive option. And also um, at the time, they offered uh, supercharging free for life as long as I own the vehicle. And to this day, I have never paid once at any charger, whether it's a Tesla supercharger or a public charging station. And um, but 95 percent of my charging is done at home in my own garage. So those factors helped offset the pricing. And uh, and to this day, I, I don't regret that decision whatsoever. I love my car. Mm -hmm. So I'll add um, to your point, Rob, about um, the software, the Tesla software, which is really helping the drivers to plan for a trip, knowing where the stations are. Um, Tesla, um, in my opinion, has definitely by far the most sophisticated software system and a great benefit for the, um, for the owners or leasers. But so the other um, uh, EV OEMs do have a, a you know, good platform as well, not as strong, but you have access to some apps on the market for public charging that are, um, you know, bringing the information of all type of chargers, level two and DC charging. And uh, it's a little bit more up to you to plan your trip. So I'm, I'm seeing in the chat right now and some comments, 
um, some questions about the range. Um, uh, a long trip, you know, it is challenging. Let's face it. Uh, not too many people cross the U.S. with a, an EV. Uh, you need two weeks to do it. So, um, but even let's say a five, six hundred miles trip, um, if you're going to do it with an EV, it's absolutely feasible, of course. But uh, you need to plan it. You need to know why you're going to stop. Ideally, of course, you find um, DC fast chargers. So, um, a car like, uh, you know, we talk about uh, the leaf, the bolt, they do charge in uh, 20 minutes, about 200 miles. So, it goes pretty fast now with uh, fast charging. Uh, we'll talk later about different networks that are available on the market that has been expanding greatly. And um, and that's what you need to do. You do a little bit more planning than what you would do with a nice car. Now, uh, frankly, when we do a fairly long road trip, uh, most of us have to stop. You know, you're going to snack, you're going to have lunch or you you're resting a little bit, so you use that time to simply uh, charge. So it's not so much of an issue. And I see um, also Jim, I think it was, when he talked about uh, the, the weather, um, the co condition, it is it is a reality in a very cold weather or um, high temperature, envi temperature environment, um, the batteries deplete faster. So you need to take that into account. Also, if you drive fast, if you drive at 80 or 90 miles an hour, zzz, the battery, <laughs> the battery uh, um, capabilities uh, diminish greatly. So those are, are things you learn, you know, over time. But it's all all planning. Marilyn, I have to echo that. You know, my use case is a little bit different. My first EV really, like yours, only got about 80 miles. Um, that range is now down to about 50. Uh, my son has it. He lives in Houston, which is really difficult to get around with, you know, only 50 miles range. But what we found is our use case is really just around town close to home. Even my current 2016, it's never going to see Topeka, which is about an hour away, hour and a half away. That's not what we use it for. I can get to the airport. Fine. I can actually with the new one, get round trip to the airport. That's 40 miles each way, which is fine. Uh, there's free charging out by the airport, which is always nice. So by the time I get there, plug it in. Usually whenever I find I'm landing somewhere, I get the email that it's fully charged, which is nice. Um, but to charge it at home, that's about a 10, 12 hour when it's fairly low, about a 10, 12 hour experience. Uh, but I only use 110. I have yeah. installed install a 220, but it works fine. Hmm. You know, we have free charging at Black & Beach. We have free charging at my health club. Uh, those are both places I tend to be for an hour, hour and a half, whatever. Uh, when work and before times, you know, you'd be there every day. So it was easy enough to get an hour, hour and a half on a fast charger, which would get me 20, 25 miles a day. Sometimes I get two, three hours on it or all afternoon, all morning, whatever. So it went a long way towards taking care of that. Um, but definitely range is an issue. Um, we are, we do have our other car is an ICE, as Rob mentioned, internal combustion engine. So when we do road trips, uh, we have an Avalon. It's great on the open road, goes long distance. So for me, my use case, I focus on the shorter distance around town runabout. It's a town car. And that's all we, we intend to use it for. Once again, I would recommend, request, ask folks that are participating, um, that are viewing, please enter your comments. We welcome your experience uh, as well. Um, it, it's useful to learn from others kind of their issues and what they've experienced. All right. Let me ask a question that I get asked a lot. Um, Paul, you start off with this one. Did it cost you more than a regular car when you bought your, your EVs? What was your thought? And then Rob, if you'll take it after that. So we, we bought the full price leaf at the beginning and, and that was full boat. So, you know, we were probably paying a bit of a premium. We did have opportunities though, to save tremendously on fueling. So that, that really, really kind of leveled it out for each of our, and, and there were no inventory in those earlier days, right? You, you would put an order in and then six more months later, you would have an opportunity. Um, as, as uh, you know, kind of noted, Rob talked about financing, talked about incentives. You know, I, I think that you need to, you know, make a car buying choice and, and be proactive about figuring out how the finances are going to work out. Um, but by and large right now, if you take the maintenance into it, you take the cost of fueling, you're, you're going to come out ahead uh, when you can fit it into your, you know, your lifestyle, your use case. 
Yeah. Um, one of the, I'd mentioned a couple of things previously, uh, you know, the federal tax credit, mm -hmm. the $7,500 tax credit was uh, a big factor um, uh, to help offset the premium you do pay for a Tesla. Um, certainly the 0% financing was interesting. In fact, I asked him if I could pay him double and uh, get free money at 0% and invested in the market, but they didn't go for that. Um, you know, the one thing that I wanted to and, and ended up not taking the larger battery option, it was, I believe at that time, it was either 15 or $20,000 extra to get a battery that had a, a third more capacity compared to the 75 kilowatt hour battery that I currently have. And I do regret that. I, I think today uh, I get about just over 220 miles on a full battery charge at 75 kilowatt hours. Uh, I today would have easily paid a bit more for the 100 kilowatt hour battery. And that would have uh, provided at least uh, another 80 to 100 miles in the range. And, and that's something that I think would have been more useful. Uh, so my advice to new EV owners, is if you do get the option, you know, try to make the economics work out for the larger battery, even though it may cost you a, a fair amount up front. Uh, I, I found that the next time I purchase an EV, I'll go for the largest battery I can. Marilyn, your thoughts? So upfront cost for me what was for the type of model I was looking at was definitely uh, higher than a nice car. But like we said earlier, you know, when you calculate the total cost of ownership, um, charging being so much lower when you charge at home, but even by using uh, fast chargers um, in the market and uh, the low level of maintenance um, that you have, really low cost of maintenance, then by, I would say, as an average, maybe three or four years, you recover that difference uh, of cost. So the return on investment is really good. And then, of course, you feel good about not polluting the air. You know, it's interesting. So like I mentioned, I'm not a, a new car guy. But if you think about buying a used EV, they're surprisingly quite a bit less than other cars in the market. Um, I don't know. The inexpensive price of gently used older EVs, it's a little known secret, I think, these days. The older ones, of course, don't go as far, which is probably why they're, you know, out there, why people trading up and whatnot. And But since they can't go that far, they typically have pretty low miles on them. They're not used all that much. Um, clearly, if you need to go, you know, interstate or go on longer trips, that's not an option. But what I'm finding, um, most of these were leased or returned by people that didn't like the, the, the range issue in their daily needs. Like I said, for me, it hasn't been a problem. So between free charging and an inexpensive car, it, it's worked out quite well. All right, a few other questions here. So this I get, I talk to people a lot, you know, what do you like best about driving electric? What are the benefits, you know, what is one benefit maybe you didn't consider before purchasing, purchasing it? That was a nice surprise. Marilyn, if you'll take it, the lead here, then I'll follow it. Sure. So um, I think we mentioned a little bit earlier, for me, it's a quality of driving, uh, the silence you have in the car, of course, not having an engine running. Um, uh, and I would say uh, this capability to, to respond extremely well to situation on the road, uh, because we can accelerate extremely rapidly and also decelerate and break uh, rapidly, uh, it, you get a sense of security that's really um, amazing to me. Uh, so we, um, you feel less tired, especially if you go on road trip uh, by um, driving a car, but also in traffic. I'm seeing on the chat here, somebody's talking about, you know, heavy traffic environment, um, Southeast Asia, um, EV actually perform extremely well in that environment because you um, uh, you use a brake a lot, so you actually uh, you know generate um, additional power when you use a brake, and uh, you almost uh, use no power uh, when you are close to uh, no movement. So it's extremely efficient. Um, uh, EVs are extremely efficient in a traffic environment. So that's another benefit. And again, by being silent. Uh, you feel less tired um, uh, if you're on the road quite quite a lot. So that's why I see the main benefits uh, for me on the driving experience. Yeah, uh, Paul? Yeah, I'll, I'll take and, and talk a little bit more about regen because I think that's something that I probably didn't appreciate as much as I do now. 
Um, and, and to really describe this, the vehicle, when you, depending on your settings on the car, when you let off the accelerator, it actually decelerates and it recovers energy back into the battery. So we live in an area that has a hill. And, and by the way, if you make it to the top, you could be empty. But by the time you get to the bottom of the hill, you'll have plenty for driving around town. Um, and it, and that's, that's just magical that I think that folks don't really fully appreciate what's going on there. Um, so that instead of using the, the brakes, it's running the motor effectively in a braking mode and recovering that energy. That's really something interesting. And it does play into um, the ability to adapt that into how you drive. And you don't need to use the brake pedal anymore. You just use the accelerator. And that that is just something, again, some folks don't really like it, but I, I, I totally enjoy that part of it because you're really integrated in a sort of the race car driver mode without having to shift. <clears throat> Yeah, Paul, I love that feature as well. I, I've learned to drive without even touching the, the brakes, you know, on certain trips. It's a really nice feature. I didn't even consider that. The other thing I didn't consider was, as I indicated earlier, uh, the vehicle I own today, four years after purchasing it, is an improved version due to the numerous software updates. Uh, Tesla updates the software on average about once every 30 or 45 days. And, you know, I'm always seeing new features, new functionality, improvements. Um, the only thing I'm waiting on is a new micro trip for the uh, micro chip for the monitor. Uh, the one that they originally installed is too slow. It's been recalled. Uh, and I'm waiting 10 months now for the, <laughs> the supply chain to catch up and provide chips. Um, so that's, that's also been a, a very good uh, item. And, you know, like I said earlier, I've, uh, I've actually used some of the apps that Marilyn talked about to find public charging stations, and you can plan your trip accordingly. In fact, there are times I'll, I'll stop at a hotel and stay overnight because they do have charging available at that hotel, whether it's Tesla chargers or otherwise. And so having the adapters you need to use any kind of public charging infrastructure uh, is also a nice thing to, to have in, you know, equipment in your trunk. And, uh, you know, I just uh, enjoy, you know, the fact that uh, you have a lot of flexibility on where you can go and more and more uh, charging stations are appearing these days, and, and Black and & Beach is instrumental in helping design and build many of those around the country. So it's uh, it's a great experience, and, you know, as more people adopt EVs, uh, the, the number of chargers will only increase from here. Uh, but I also, um, Peter, I know you talked about charging at home. I, I calculated about a year ago that I've probably charged 95% of the uh, capacity of that battery over time at home, and I initially made the investment uh, when I moved into a new house about three years ago to have an electrician wire a 40 amp circuit in the garage so I could charge on 40 amps at 220 volts or 240 volts. And I tell you, it cuts the charging down, time down in less than half of what it used to take on a 110 volt charger. So uh, that has made it uh, more refreshing to go on multiple trips and not worry about charging uh, to a full state or an 80 or 90% state on the battery. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned about the infrastructure improvements and stuff around here. Anyway, we're seeing movie theaters, grocery stores, all sorts of shops. I mean, I, I think these people are smart to put these chargers out there. They don't charge for them, which is nice, but you're going to be there for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, a movie, whatever. It, it's really been nice. And, and I think in my own world, what I tell people, yeah, power and acceleration. Yeah. You can't match it. You know, the EV doesn't need a transmission because a motor has full torque from the moment you, you touch it. It's fun. Not having to go to gas stations. Oh my gosh. I still have to do it occasionally for my wife. What a pain. Something about just the, the, the toxic carcinogens that I don't have to mess with. That's good. You know, I now I'm really detest when I have to do it for my wife. It is what it is, but Doing charging at home, the few times I've actually done that, and I had to do it recently because for some reason my uh, iPhone managed to find the side of the freeway the hard way, falling off the back of my wife's trunk, and okay. wasn't able to go to chargers. Uh, and usually, with most of the chargers, there's an NFC connection uh, to wake the charger up and, and let it let it know that it's you. So I've had a bit of an issue there. So I've had to charge a few times at home. That is what it is. When you talk about maintenance, it's like, what is that? Um, I do find, I don't know if other uh, EV owners on, on the call note that I go through tires a bit quicker. And I, I'm not sure if it's because maybe it, it's the run quiet, softer tire. I suspect it's most likely because I drive the thing like a banshee. 
Um, you know, I have fun barreling out of corners and punching it as I come around. You know, it's just too easy. It's so quiet, so smooth. You've got all that strength there. It's a low center of gravity, so it hugs the ground really well. I'm sure I'm taking some battery hit. I mean, some tire hit when I do that, but it is what it is. There's virtually no maintenance. The only fluids really are washer fluid and brake fluid. Brakes, as Paul mentioned, are regenerative, so you're not even using the brakes a whole lot. There's no exhaust system. There's no transmission. There, there's no belts. I mean, all those things are just gone. They're just not there. Extra weight, you're not lugging around. Really, the only moving part of the drivetrain under the hood is the rotor inside the motor. And soon, the motors are actually going to be in the wheels. So, you know, we're seeing it in tremendous improvements. So I, it's really a fun vehicle to drive. And, and I enjoy showing friends. It's a fun part. You know, what the electric experience is all about. You get in, you turn it on, and they're like, well, it's not making any noise. And I say, yeah, it makes about all the same rumble and grind as your average light switch. It's on. You see the lights, you know it's on. I know some of the others make a really interesting, I know the Volt has a beautiful sort of sound as it comes up, sounds like the Starship Enterprise. But it's great. You can actually talk while you're on the highway without having to raise your voice because of the background noise, which you begin to realize after driving miles in the EV, we drive my wife's car, that's an issue. The other issue that I noticed we we've kind of resolved, my wife will take the car downtown when she goes to work these days. Um, she only works half weeks and because I'm working from home or even when I'm not, it's easy enough for her to drive my car around trip and save the gas there. So we swap, use hers for long distance, use mine when we're doing others. Okay, another question. One of the biggest fears about owning an EV is range anxiety. I see Jim had asked a question on that. What about your experience? Will you run out of charge? Have you run out of charge? I think, Marilyn, you've had an experience with that. Paul, follow up because you've had a bunch of EVs. And Rob, I guess with the Tesla, you never run out of charge because you've got that whole network behind you. So, so yeah. Um, oh, I think I'm jumping, right? Peter? Yeah, you, please. You, you do. You're the moderator. Um, yeah, I had an experience and um, I want to compare it with, you know, anything that happened with a nice car if you break down. It's a, um, in my case, that's when I had the Nissan Leaf where the range was still, again, at 120 max and uh, miscalculating, you know, the, the time I needed to return home from a meeting or, or a trip, whatever it was. Um, there's a very simple thing that happens that you call AAA, just like you would call um, uh, when you have an issue with your, your ICE car. And uh, AAA simply uh, doesn't, you know, charge on site, although they could, but just for a few miles because they have a generator usually on their pickup truck. But uh, they take you to the closest charging station, very simply, the public charging station. And if you need you know, um, enough, um, I would say, you know, 30 or 50 miles quickly, of course, ideally you go to a DC charger. So it's getting easier and easier on the marketplace because uh, of this access to uh, public charging. Um, so that uh, definitely happened to me actually maybe uh, twice uh, in six years when I had the leaf, it never happened to me at the Bolt. But I have to say when you're an EV uh, driver, you, you learn um, how, how to plan things and uh, with the um, high access to uh, public charging, it gets easier and easier. And the other element is uh, somebody asked in the chat about the public charging and, and um, uh, the connectors, you know, to make sure uh, uh, that you have a car that's going to connect with uh, the, the chargers that are available in the market. So all EVs are standard in terms of type of um, uh, connection, except the Tesla. So that's why the Tesla superchargers have their own network, a proprietary network with their own technology. Uh, so if you have a, any other EV, you cannot charge on a Tesla network, but uh, vice versa, all other charging station you see on the market, um, you can use. And again, there's uh, slow charging. Let's say you're gonna spend, uh, like Rob mentioned, many hours in a hotel. Of course, you can charge at night in the hotel. Um, at the workplace, there's more and more companies now that offer uh, level two charging station. Your, your car is sitting for many hours in the parking lot, then you can charge there. And then, um, and then of course, if you need fast charging, there are more and more available across the country. We'll talk later, but one network that um, has progressed 
tremendously in, in the US is with Electrify America. So that's my experience. Yes, early on, uh, AAA called twice, <laughs> but since uh, things have been really good. Uh, Paul? Yes, so with all the different cars, um, we've actually never run out of charge. Um, so, and that's our daughters learning to drive electric and, and driving over that, the, if you know the Santa Cruz mountains, driving over Highway 17. Um, we've had some close calls and I would say that's part about learning about your car or what are the range limitations? What, what are the warnings? What, how far can you go? Um, how many, you know, uh, morsels or uh, drops of uh, electrons call it you have left in the, the battery or the tank um, and just learning the car and testing its limits. And I will say we've, you know, they call it turtle mode or a few other different modes. We have been in that mode on every single car that we've owned. Um, but you need to learn what that means and, and um, respect it because you, you don't really want to be on the side of the road. Yeah, I have to say uh, my experience is very similar to Paul's. I've never run out of full battery capacity. Uh, I've come pretty close, so I've tried. <laughs> I've cut down to 5% a couple of times. But what's cool about the Tesla software, it does start to throttle back things like the air conditioning and the fan speed in order to conserve. Once you do go down below a certain threshold on the battery in terms of the percent uh, state of charge. So, um, you know, you just have to, to either trust that software is going to find you a supercharger or... Uh, Marilyn, you mentioned this. Uh, one of my favorite apps as an EV owner is called PlugShare. And PlugShare is really good at showing you both public and private charging locations. And in fact, it, it's like a brotherhood out there of EV owners who say, well, if you're in an emergency situation and you want to drop by my house, I've got a charger in my garage. I'll let you use it for an hour or so to get you back on the road. I mean, you see those kind of locations available to you. And, and so knowing that, you know, you can tap into a nationwide network of both public and private charging. Uh, like I said, I, I bought my car at the time when Tesla offered free supercharging for life, uh, which I understand they no longer offer that benefit. Um, but, you know, it, it's good and reassuring to know that you have the tools available to you to be able to locate charging locations, uh, even those that may not even be considered public locations. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, here in, in Kansas City, so we use ChargePoint. I guess they got the, the jump on, on the city when it came time to, to set up the charging infrastructure. It turns out the local power company here at the time installed 1,100 chargers. Um, the, the deal was if you were the host, you got two years um, where you had to agree not to charge anybody to, for them to charge at your, at your site. And then after that, you could charge whatever you want. As it so happens, sort of fun facts, you know, in telling Kansas City, for a while, we had the largest number of level two chargers per capita anywhere in the world. In fact, it just so happens that the Black and Beach World Headquarters, with its 41 chargers, happens to be the epicenter of charging in the Kansas City area. Most of these chargers were free to use, especially early on. Many still are. So I don't know whether we still hold the Guinness Book of World Records as having the most per capita, but it was very convenient to be here in Kansas City. When it comes to charging, I find it costs about 15 cents a kilowatt. That's our charge, um, our uh, charge after all the costs and, and whatnot, the expenses. That's uh, the charge per additional kilowatt that I add to my bill. Um, quite a bit of the bill, obviously, is taxes and, and, and delivery charge, stuff like that for power. But I get anywhere from three to four miles per kil per kilowatt. So my cost is anywhere from four to five cents a mile, which compared to my wife's car, which is lucky to get 25 miles to the gallon. If she's, you know, paying 250 a gallon, which would be pretty inexpensive these days right there, that's 10 cents a gallon. So the, the, the cost is less. As far as running out of power, we've gotten down into single digits any number of times, low single digits. I've never hit turtle mode. Um, but it, once again, my use case is a town car, so it's not really, really likely that we would run out of charge. Um, so we get to the point where we really need to charge. We can do something at home as necessary. Um, friends that ask about it, I tell them it's sort of like your, your cell phone. I, I don't know how long the charge lasts. It lasts until I recharge it the next night. So that's kind of been my experience, a bit of a non-issue. You do have to plan occasionally. I know if my wife's taking the car downtown on Thursday, so Tuesday or Wednesday, I need to be thinking about getting it filled up. 
not a big, big issue. All right, let's steer the conversation a little bit towards the future. Information that people may not know about, especially folks that really are kind of new to the EV world. Marilyn, Paul, you guys both live in California. You guys have real scenarios like wildfires when utility power might not be available. How do you guys manage that? Marilyn, go if you yep. would, please. All right, thank you. So, um, yeah, part of uh, Black & Veatch uh, services and expertise is in power and uh, working with the utilities for um, resiliency, redundancy, and, and to manage a power outage. So, um, we have um, uh, years of years of experience with power to mitigate uh, uh, power outage. can be due to uh, fires, but uh, many other reasons, right? Uh, can be in a hurricane in other part of the country, uh, um, all kind of issues. So um, our company uh, works with uh, the different stakeholders works in this industry to have system like uh, microgrid, uh, but more specifically even energy storage on site in order to um, be able to have backup solution when you have a power outage. So when company, so Tesla have done it uh, on, on many sites. Uh, one company does um, uh, these backup systems a lot is Electrify America, where we see more and more chargers across the country. Those are DC fast chargers of 150 kilowatt to 350 kilowatt. And um, uh, many of them do have uh, backup energy storage. So. Uh, that's one thing for the public, you know, to know of not all stations. So same like uh, Rob mentioned, you know, uh, an application like PlugChair uh, might, might have that information or the app of each of those companies, you know, Electrify America has one, uh, EVgo has one, ChargePoint has one. And they will let you know if uh, the charging site uh, is operational or not. And, you know, we're, trying, we're working really hard to make them 24 seven operational at all time. But uh, it's a work in progress to add those um, energy storage. And I would say at home, it's a little bit of the same issue is, uh, you know, um, the habit as an EV owner is that you always top off, top it off, you know, your car, you charge at night. Uh, if you're not even at 50% down, you know, the tendency is you, you charge whenever you can. And uh, ideally uh, with the, the price going down on, on local energy storage for your own home, uh, that might be a good thing to have as a backup. And um, uh, in California, especially, uh, there's more and more options to to add uh, this system at your home um, in case of outage. We usually never have an outage more than uh, two or three days, but that's enough to to being, make you uh, being stranded at your home, for sure. Uh, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll add some things. And so, you know, same thing about topping off. Yes, of course, um, being available for that. And then being thinking about it as far as like what is in your area, what are in fact when PG&E is now publishing their outages and they have um, centers for water, for, for you know, snacks even, um, they do publish whether they have EV charging on site. So that's kind of an interesting thing that's coming along. And I would say back to the distributed opportunities, uh, you know, large transit agencies are looking at that mission critical, like what is their outage scenario planning? You know, what does your fleet look like? Is it 10% that you need to be sure you can power? So, so start to think of it like a, like a fleet operator. And then the amazing thing about technologies that are coming along is, is home energy storage, but also coupling with solar and those being able to become off grid type solutions so that you, in fact, you know, if a gas station doesn't have electricity, it can't even pump gas but you may find yourself in a future where you can get energy for your vehicle and others actually can't. Um, so stay, stay tuned on that, but the energy hub for homes is becoming more and more of a real thing if you look at uh, Tesla and Lucid and, and even the Ford F-150, by the way, which is an amazing new development and opening eyes to EVs, energy is potentially becoming more in your control. So I, I think it's pretty exciting. You know, it's interesting. We've seen quite a bit of development there. Um, I know between the apps and, and Rob, of course, with Tesla, you're mentioning the apps that you have available. Of course, with the leaf, we don't have the Easter eggs and whatnot, but there's certainly a lot you can tell, like state of charge of your car. So that, that kind of minimizes that issue. I know on our end, you, you can look at your phone to see the state of charge of your car. Um, 
what it's worth, I end up when I'm plugged in it in the summer out in the hot parking lot, I can turn the AC on an hour or so before I go out there and run it off the pole where it's free. Um, so th there are advantages there. But but having secure power source, I think it's going to be interesting as time goes on, as, as we see more and more of that. One last question. And, and once again, I think you guys are well positioned to answer this. So, you know, as Black & Beach, we've designed engineering, permitted, constructed over 1,500 electric vehicle charging sites. That totals thousands of chargers. Let me ask you guys to opine a bit about the work you're doing to help advance the zero emission vehicle adoption. Paul, let me ask you to kick it off. How's the build out of EV charging going? Do we have enough chargers today? Where do you see it heading? Marilyn, if you'd follow that and then Rob, pick it up. Yeah, so it's going um, in a good direction. Um, and, and we need to continue to make awareness of, of all the benefits of driving electric and getting that preparedness for, you know, a pretty big lift on the spend. If we start to talk about commercial vehicles, um, which have some of the biggest impacts on health or communities, um, and then they have bigger, bigger batteries, bigger charging demands. So I think we're on a good trend. Um, if, but we do need to look at continually um, bringing all the parties to play, private sector, um, what our utilities can bring to the table. And of course, if you, you know, look at the current administration, what's coming from the federal side, there are billions of dollars that are coming together and billions more needed. So, you know, stay, stay tuned, but I think that that's something that we have to continue to enforce that you need to be planning ahead if you're a utility, you need to be planning ahead if you're a fleet, you have you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands of vehicles. So getting involved in that and understanding that it's not just buying the vehicle, it's about the infrastructure uh, in order to be successful. Marilyn, what's your so, take? Yeah, I would add that there are some programs, really good programs with the various utilities on the market, what they call Make Ready, uh, that we Black & Rich is involved in, where the utilities are getting involved to help their own customers. So public, uh, private uh, customers, uh, residential and for the fleet market, but including at the workplace where they uh, take on the build of the infrastructure with their own budget. So. Um, there's a really a push on the market nationwide uh, for utilities to be deregulated, to be able to get involved in the build of the infrastructure, which is what we need. Uh, people who live in uh, multi-unit dwellings and apartment usually cannot uh, um, charge at their home. So they absolutely do need the access to parking somewhere, um, either at night or at their work. And like you described, Peter, earlier that, you know, it's possible to park and charge at your work and then uh, never have to charge even at home. So uh, we need those alternatives, of course. And um, I would say since I've been in the EV space for 15 years, uh, um, the, la the acceleration of the build of the infrastructure is tremendous. Like Paul mentioned, there's a very strong uh, federal support right now, which is going to accelerate uh, the build of the infrastructure. Uh, Tesla was definitely a visionary early on to build their network. Um, they started, you know, with, I would say, four or five hundred sites uh, seven or eight years ago. They were already building their infrastructure. And now the other network are catching up for all other type of EVs. Uh, one of the large ones uh, that we're involved in uh, is uh, Electrify America. Where we, As an example, we've built um, 600 sites in the last four years, so nationwide. So it's tremendous. And again, it's, you know, connecting all the metropolitan areas of the U.S. and having charges on the freeways pretty much. I don't want to say everywhere because we're still far from covering the market, but uh, we're getting there and uh, there are funds available. So we're very optimistic about the future. Great. Hey. Rob? Mm. Rob, yeah, real quick, I was just going to say, if we, we need to, between the energy and the automotive industries, <clears throat> break down the barriers to get to vehicle to grid connectivity. And, you know, as an EV owner, if I'm commuting to a business and parking my vehicle for eight hours in a public charge location, I, hey, I'd be happy to monetize the value of the capacity of my battery if the, if the utility needs it to mitigate peak demand on their system and they're willing to pay me for it. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got a potential demand out there for these scenarios. We've got business owners who are willing to invest in EVs. And I think, you know, the, the next generation of EV owners 
probably need that additional benefit to be able to make the business case in their mind uh, as a, a way to justify the premium expense for EVs. So uh, vehicle to grid would be a, a really cool future for all of us. Great. Well, let's wrap up with everyone explaining one last time a project you're working in, working on something new that um, most folks may not be familiar with. There's a lot of activity in the EV space. So what's an exciting project you've worked on recently? Paul, why don't you kick it off? Marilyn, and then Rob will wrap up with you. Yes, so I, I, a majority of the work we do is anonymous, by the way. We can't talk about it. So we do get a public thing that we can share. It's really exciting. Um, something I've been part of now for over three years is the, the, the making of Electric Island. Um, and it is now, you can kind of find it on out there, uh, work with Daimler Trucks and PGE, Portland General Electric, to design, engineer, and construct the, the first public charging um, site for medium heavy duty trucks in North America. So talking about megawatt scale for charging and making it available for, for you know, all sorts of fleets to try this out. So I would, I would encourage people to take a look at it. We've got some good materials to learn more and, uh, and reach out if you have questions. Great, Marilyn? Um, I work a lot on the fleet market as well. Uh, what's very interesting for me is uh, electric buses and uh, the development of those uh, buses across the country now that the OEMs are uh, producing more at a higher level uh, of those buses. So um, we just did one, finished one, for example, in Vail, Colorado, where you, know, you have such a pristine environment and um, to contribute to not have, uh, you know, zero, or to have zero gas emission uh, buses, it's, it's very re re rewarding. And uh, back in California, Southern California, especially where we have a lot of uh, pollution issues and health issues related to gas emission, to be able to contribute with public transportation in electrification of the buses, it's very gratifying. And um, Black and Beach is very involved in that. And I personally um, enjoy my work every day very much to, to contribute to lower emission. Yes. That's great. That's great. Rob, why don't you wrap it up for us? Yeah, <clears throat> just one quick final comment. Uh, you know, the, these charging stations, as they continue to be built and sited, are going to have a, a certain impact to the utility power system. And so uh, we're in the business of helping those utilities mitigate those impacts and upgrade their facilities on their side of the meter in order to accommodate uh, this increase in peak demand we're going to see for charging stations all around the country. Thank you, Peter. You bet. You bet. Great. Well, I want to thank each of the panelists. You bring a very interesting perspective to the world of electric vehicles. We each have our own experiences, obviously. We've each been, pardon the pun, down the road a bit with these and, and have learned quite a bit through the process. Hopefully our viewers found this to be interesting and have had some good experiences on their own. So I guess let's wrap it up for here. We went over a couple minutes. Apologies for that. Thank you for joining today.